Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Kata and Arm, a secure alternative in the 5G space. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand it over to Kyle Freed, Principal Solutions Engineer at Arm. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to speak as an attendee, but there is a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And basically, please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand it over to Kyle to kick off today's presentation. Hello everybody, again, uh, my name is Kyle Freet, uh, Principal Solutions Engineer here at ARM. So uh, I started my life here at ARM actually as a DevOps engineer working on major infrastructure systems here. So, uh, you know, all the major hyperscalers, so AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, I recently moved to another team where we focus 100% on these hyperscalers. So think of it mostly as like taking on projects that are x86 based, uh, trying to focus them back onto ARM or maybe providing adjustments or you know, performance based changes to them. So that way we can perform and excel on all the hyperscalers. Um, as of recent, I've been mostly focused on 5G and networking within the ARM technology. So let's talk a little bit about the agenda today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about 5G itself. Um, unfortunately, 5G is full of acronyms. It's, uh, I think they kind of do it on purpose to make it harder to understand in my opinion. So we're gonna have to go through a lot of acronyms to understand kind of what the importance of the RIC is, which is the main topic of this here, along with CATA. I'll talk a little bit about ORAN, which is one of many different groups that are trying to do this here. And uh, is everyone able to see my slides, by the way? Am I, is it moving? Just got a notification saying that's not moving. They are not moving right now. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, let me try the entire screen then. Sorry about that. <laughs> no okay, um, so sorry about go. that. Okay, so let's try this one more time. So uh, let's go over the agenda once more. So uh, 5G and technologies and all that aspect here. So we're gonna have to go over a lot of acronyms, unfortunately. There's a lot of systems that are all integrated in this entire RAN, this entire whole package of this. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about ARM and its aspects within 5G. We'll talk about the RIC, which is one of the platforms that I did, uh, the trans, you know, I moved from x86 over to ARM. We'll talk a little more about that performance requirements associated with it. And then um, from there, we're gonna talk about how the importance of the RIC is within in the RAN itself and the security implications of that. Um, and then we're gonna talk about deploying the RIC and how that's currently done and how we expect to do that. And then um, we're also gonna talk about a little bit more about uh, the orchestration life cycle how it deals with dealing with upgrades and aspects of that. I'll finish, you know, finish up with the conclusion remarks, and then we'll have some time for the Q&A. So acronyms, unfortunately this page is just full of them. Uh, this is just kind of a prerequisite for this. I'm gonna go over some of the major ones here. Here on the slides, so that way people can actually when I'm trying to go through some diagrams. So we, we got the RIC. So that that is the RAN intelligent controller. Think of this thing as the brain that can that uh, takes in decisions from other aspects of the system, modifies them, uh, modifies them on the fly, and then we also have different components that are also like the non real time RIC, which takes in configuration things. They make changes, but they're not necessarily in real time. They're not fast, they're kind of slow. Maybe it's configuration where we're adding a radio or something like that along those lines. And then we have the CU, the DU and the RU. So the RU is basically the radio unit. That's that's the thing that you see like on the poles when you're driving by on the, on the freeway or whatever. That's basically what connects to your UE with your user device, uh, user equipment. And then from there, the U, the RU is connected to this DU, which is basically uh, 
digitizing what is coming off of the radio unit. And then you have this centralized unit, which is something that can control many, many DUs. Now, an RU um, can be considered something like a GNB or a GNodeB or ENOB. Um, so I reference 4G here as the ENOB because really we've already spent a ton of money in 4G to get this up and running. A lot of countries and you know servers and sorry operators are still using 4G. So this infrastructure is going to last for a long time. It's not going to go away instantly as soon as 5G becomes a you know a mainstream aspect of this. Um, there's also that confusing thing as well here. So GNOBs, which are 5G nodes, are also called new radio, or you know G standing for next generation. So again, these acronyms are just relatively hard to understand. So that's why I wanted to provide this to you. And then some of the interfacing between each other, so like the A1 interfaces, which basically communicates between the non-real-time RIC and the real-time RIC. Then we have EUs, uh, sorry, E1s and E2 interfaces, which communicate between aspects. And then the almighty X2, which is the interface between these different um, node Bs, these E node B, G node Bs. Um, so we'll move on here. So I want to talk a little bit more about the history of the entire service. So we started, you know, as 1G, that was basically voice. You're talking about those bricks that people used to walk around with. And then we moved into 2G, which was also known as kind of like GSM. So that's a basically improved voice, maybe a little bit of texting. And then we have 3G, which are integrated voice um, that, that kind of had a little bit of an internet access to it as well, but we're talking about two megabits per second, relatively slow speeds. And then we you know, have 4G LTE, which is kind of like the main standard right now, which is up to about 100 megabits per second. And then we get to 5G. 5G is, I think the record right now that I saw for Nokia was 4.7 gigabits per second. So we're talking just a ton of throughput compared to previous generation here. Now, with 2G and 3G specifically, you know, people were using controllers. Uh, it was very fixed setups. A lot of orchestration and management was just done basically one time. A lot of people using multiple different systems. Um, with 4G, the idea was, hey, if we use these interfaces between each other using these X2, um, we can be, uh, we, you know, we could purchase multiple different types of RUs, different types of systems, and they could all communicate with each other. We thought of this X2 as kind of like an open interface. Well, what really happened was a lot of these vendors actually took their X2 interfaces and kind of modified it. So they said, oh, ours does, you know, X, Y, and Z. The other one does, you know, X, Y, and I don't know, B or something like that. So really what it did is it caused a lot of this vendor lock-in because then they couldn't really communicate with each other. Now with ORAN, so the ORAN Alliance, they kind of thought about this and they said, okay, we're, we're going the vendor lock-in route here. We need to try to open this up so that way, you know, if we want to use a better uh, radio unit or we want to use different equipment for different aspects, maybe I want to, you know, customize this in some way and not just be forced to use, I don't know, Ericsson, Nokia, whatever it might be, and only use that for the entire system. This allowed one to be more open so all of them can communicate with each other. You could reduce costs. You know, you can enable different equipment in different areas based off utilization. Maybe it's, you know, you know, a farm town area where there's a lot less utilization instead of being in, you know, downtown New York City. Now you're not, you know, you're not buying such a large expensive machine for every little aspect of this. You can kind of cut and paste them together. And, you know, all these different people also are part of the ORAN Alliance. You're gonna see some big names here as well. So, you know, we're talking Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile for the United States at least. And then, you know, so we're talking about China Mobile, uh, SoftBank, those are big aspects outside of the United States that also kind of want to be part of this, this new openness infrastructure. So let's talk about ARM here. So where does ARM fit? So previous, you know, most previous generations, 2G, 3G, 5, you know, 4G, 5, even 5G in this aspect, a lot of this is x86 based. So we're talking Intel systems or proprietary products, these kind of systems that are running major applications that are, you know, behemoth, monolithic. Um, so the idea was with 5G, we really want to get into that aspect. We want to be able to provide, especially with 5G being more of containerized and DNFs, you know, we want to be in all the different aspects of 5G to you know, provide our performance and our optimization here. Now, a lot of times, I don't know, 
uh, depending on, I guess, where you're located, for me in the United States, 5G just really didn't seem like that. It was kind of like a hype. You know, it's people kind of thought about it. They're like, oh, it's a little bit better than 4G. You know, you had 5G e coming out on AT&T and you saw it on your cell phone and you got started seeing cell phones that had 5G. But it was just kind of like, I don't know where I'm going to use it or when it's going to happen. Well, really, uh, in general, it actually has launched and it has been really uh, taking over the systems here. So this is a report for June of 2021. 22,000 5G sites already with under 160 operators. So we're already, you know, a few months behind on this report here. And then we also have billions of devices that are already 5G. And as you can see from the map, you know, we have the United States. We already have launched 5G networks. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that as well. And, you know, we have other companies or other countries as well that are deploying them or heavily investing in them or doing these soft launches. I think originally when I first read about 5G, I think it was like uh, Korea that was really pushing this here. Now, with with ARM, you know, we want to be in the core systems. We want to be part of the 5G core, the LTE core even. We want to be part of the RAN. We want to be part of those distribution units, those centralized units that are connected to those ENO beads, GNO beads. And then we're already on the RIC because that's what I was working on here and the high L1s and the small cells, L1, 2, and 3s. Now, um, when we mention 5G and LTE, we're talking about also connecting these existing 4G systems to have an e -no, or, sorry, a Geno B, which is basically, or EN Geno B, which is basically a specialized connector that runs 5G on a 4G system. So think of these as two, sem uh, two separate systems that are running these RUs, these, uh, you know, these radio units here. So you get a phone that has 4G, it also has 5G, and then from there, the phone can communicate with both bands. So they're basically doing 4G and 5G. Now, uh, most of the systems may not have the 5G back in, especially since it's still kind of in the development phase right now. But at this point, you know, your phone is able to utilize both 4G and 5G. It may route those things from the 5G GenoBead to the EnoB uh, via like an interface. But either way, you're able to get that kind of faster throughput. Now, most connectors and most systems, you know, were connected to the major internet. There's also different applications and things like that that are outside of that. Think of that maybe as like an app store or a web server, those kind of things. So part of the ARM enablement here is you've got to think of it in kind of three different aspects. So first, we, you know, we have the system. We have to develop a system that's utilized to be able to do these 5G, these aspects of it. Then you also have to write the software that enables these kind of things, acceleration. And then you need to also find the the systems, you know, the people that will create the architecture or use this and, and to deploy it further. So that's kind of like the three-step process with ARM. Um, you know, to find something that is utilized and takes on all these things is a very complex and, and, and hard problem. It's not something that you can just basically take off the shelf and just get everything up and running. That a lot of times this has to be customized or optimized for these kind of uh, aspects. Now with ARM, we really wanted to uh, target these with a software and a hardware vendor. So, as, you know, as I mentioned before in the previous slide, you know, we wanted to be in the core network, the RIC, the RAN itself, the L1 and the small cells. And you can see that we have it targeted with a software and a hardcore company, uh, in most cases, are coupled together. So that way we're able to take on that entire life cycle of the previous slide you know, providing the silicon for it, developing that, getting the software going to it, and then integrating it and using it. So we are part of almost all these different aspects here on with an ARM. Now, I wanted to highlight also a couple other aspects. So, you know, we are working on system ready. System ready is to basically make a system uh, universally the same across all these different platforms. So there's not customized software, there's not customized hardware that you have to deal with. Everything basically runs exactly the same. It's like everything runs as like a server. So we have like the Cassini project, the DPDK, all these different aspects we are all working on to, in order to kind of push forward into the 5G solution. So I, I mentioned before about the RICs. So the RIC is, uh, the near real-time RIC is the one that I worked on and that I ported over from x86 to ARM. And there's a couple different components. There's four functional components of this RIC. So we have the orchestration layer. That's that non-real-time RIC. We're talking about configuration management, 
Um, maybe you're adding a new radio, maybe a new DU, CU, whatever it might be. And those are basically doing non-real-time slower actions. And then we have the real-time RIC itself, which is a component that's between those, or sorry, underneath this here, which communicates with a non-time, uh, sorry, non-real-time RIC, takes this data in, maybe a configuration, maybe data from the overall system, does something with it. And then we have the CU stacks and the DUs after that. Now, the deployment within 5G itself, we're using a lot of VNFs, these virtualized, you know, systems, we're using containers. The idea is to distribute this across it. It's no longer some giant system that you use that has one piece of large monolithic software that runs this and you know is dependent on this huge system that has customized. We're trying to open it and we're trying to make it so that way we can scale appropriately, especially you know when I mentioned the speeds of these things, you know, 4G LT 100 megabits. 5G, we're going to 4.7 gigabits per second. I mean, that's a crazy amount of flow and performance that people are asking for. You know, and as as our lives become more and more digitalized, things cost, you know, much more. Your videos are no longer just a few megabytes. We're talking gigabytes, you know. We're talking DVD, MD, you know, HD quality that's going across these things here. We have multiple different services that are running. So throughput's a really big deal for this. So let's talk about the the RIC here. So real time RIC we talked about before, non real time RIC. So uh, to put a number on it to figure out how often these things are changing or how quickly they need to be. So this is the overall architecture of the system here. So you know we have the non RIC, non real time RIC here that's along with the service management orchestration that's sitting here. It interfaces directly via that A1 to the near real time RIC. And then this itself also has access to all these different other systems. So it's taking in this data, maybe it's chugging on this and doing some machine learning aspects of this. And I'll talk a little bit about this further. And then it's modifying the behavior of all these other systems. So um, with the, the RIC, this is a new aspect of 5G versus 4G. This is the system that helps modify and optimize it. With 4G, it was just kind of like, if the system didn't work very well or there was a lot of people utilizing it and it was slow, that's just kind of the way it worked. There was no real way for you to make these modifications. If you know, a good example is like everyone goes into a stadium or something like that and you have you know thousands of the people at the stadium, you're gonna start getting slower service. And unfortunately that's not a real like common situation. You're gonna have them all the time. So everyone's gonna deal with this kind of service degradation. Whereas with this RIC, we could say, oh, hey, I see a ton of people joining in. They're all going to the stadium here. Why don't we start directing people to different RUs and being able to help support this so that way we can get more people on the network and they can get their you know, quality of service. So I mentioned X apps. So X apps are these like third party services that are developed either by like maybe it's say an operator, maybe ORAN itself. ORAN has quite a few applications that are able to be used right now. You can modify them, you can make them yourself. And again, they're taking this data in from different components of, of the RAN itself and ingesting that and doing something with it. You know, in some cases, maybe you're not using any X apps at all and all it is doing is just management aspect of it. That's that's perfectly fine. But the real kind of exciting part of this is taking that data in, controlling, can change things instantaneously. I mean, we're talking between 10 milliseconds into a second over and over again, we're taking things and changing them all the time. So quality of service is kind of a renowned, or sorry, not, not a renowned, but a like a common theme of 5G. So we'll talk a little bit more about this performance. So, you know, this kind of breaks it down a little bit in a better picture. So these are different aspects within this RIC, and I'm kind of highlighting these different X apps. So these are kind of a, a few of the major X apps that are being pushed by ORAN. Obviously, again, they're third party, so you can make them yourself, you can develop them yourself, whatever you want to do. And we're talking about slicing. A good example of slicing is, let's say, you know, I have, um, I have maybe a medical service a bunch of different ambulances or something like that that are on a, a network slice of 5G. I have a bunch of cars, maybe smart cars that are doing this. And we're doing different optimizations for every one of those different things here on, on this like slicing app here. Radio connection optimization, maybe an example of a phone that has 5G and 4G. You can basically auto connect and say, hey, this person's uh, UE, this user's equipment should go and connect to both 4G and 5G for optimization. Like maybe maybe this tower is closer to here or this radio is closer to here, so maybe you should connect to this one instead. So these are very, very fast interactions with each other. 
And th that's what that real-time Rick is doing. It's doing these modifications and decisions very, very quickly. And that's kind of the big highlight of this. Now, what comes in an X app? So an X app can leverage lots of different things. Um, this graphic here is really good to kind of explain what aspects these things can do. You know, we can develop it in Go, C++, Python. So it kind of opens it up to a lot of different people to be able to do this. You're taking in interface data. You're talking about the A1s, the E2s. You're taking in data from all that system. You can do something with it. A good example of this is that machine learning that I, that I mentioned before. So maybe you're taking the data in. You can kind of see the, the, the throughput of all these different people. You start seeing it slow down. Maybe you want to steer them to different locations or different RUs. Um, you can tell devices, hey, you know, we have more people joining our 5G, so let's reject them from using 5G and only push them to 4G if they only have, if they are dual systems. Um, lots of different aspects of that. But again, really, this comes down to, you know, load balancing, quality of service, connectivity management, um, handover control. These are all things that this is really important on the aspect of this. So. Let's talk about some security concerns. I mean, I've, I've mentioned all these cool things about the RIC and what it can do. And we talked about how it's taking these decisions and they're splitting you know, instantaneous decisions on the system and modifying them, changing the DU, the CU, the RU, and telling it you know, to do all these different things. So that's kind of a big deal. That's something that's, that has quite a, bit, quite a bit of implications with this. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking already, yeah, okay, there's already these problems. We, we get it. There's no big deal here. But I want to kind of highlight some of these things here that we've, that, you know, that are concerns of this aspect here. So, you know, we have X apps. So the idea is that this is controlling the Enobeats, the Genobeats, the CUs, the DUs. Um, so a lot of times these applications are probably not vetted at all. I mean, an operator will probably do a good aspect of trying to vet them themselves. Maybe they're mod, you know, maybe they're having somebody write these applications for them. But in most cases, people are you know probably you know explicitly writing exploits into them. But maybe they're using older methods, or maybe they're using other packages that maybe have some exploitations on them. So you have things that maybe necessarily are not dangerous by definition, but are are in a case when when it you know an appropriate situation comes up. The other thing too is X apps are not just a single thing you run. Um, this RIC can run many, many applications at the same time. So let's say, for example, you know you're running the slicing, you know, application X app and maybe the the steering one, but from there you have a third party app, X app that also interacts with other components of that, and maybe those services are interacting with each other in a, in a uh, maybe not a a great way. Uh, perhaps, you know, maybe it's resource bound or there's, you know, having some issues with network trafficking or routing aspects of this. And then you can also have multiple of, of these, these RICs running the same application. So think of multiple different systems all running these RICs that are all controlling different DUs and CUs. And perhaps maybe those different ones are interacting with each other or those applications don't necessarily are able to communicate or, or when they do communicate, there's other problems. I think another big aspect of this is the process starvation aspect. You know, we only have so much limited resources on this here. So maybe if one X app that is doing the steering or the machine learning requires a heavy load, perhaps the other ones will starve out or not be able to communicate properly and then you'll get this quality of service. Now, um, the majority of of this entire system is all orchestrated via um, Kubernetes. So, you know, our security policies rely a lot on um, you know, the security policies aspect. So let's think about how we can take these kind of this cool technology and then bring it down and try to make it more secure. So really thinking about that Kata, since we, you know, Kubernetes is along with Docker, let's think about Kata here. So Kata is a good natural fit to kind of secure the RIC and maybe the other components within this here. So let's talk about deploying the RIC. So Kata containers, I'm not sure if everyone has seen them or heard them before, but we'll kind of go over them basically here. So Kata, OCI compliant runtimes, basically lightweight virtual machines. So we're talking something that's seamless. I can take a Docker container, uh, modify it so that now it's running Kata. It's open sourced. Many, many groups all use this here multiple architectures. So that way, you know, if there's one system that's ARM, one system that's x86, or they're all ARM, whatever it is, they're all going to be able to work there. Then you have multiple hypervisors on this here. So QEMU, we have Firecracker, that's a very popular one that's even more restricted down. 
Now, the community that is using Kata is growing. Obviously, it's very large. But the, the key takeaway here that I wanted to talk about was these you have some intersections here. So, you know, we have uh, China No Mobile, China Telecom. Those are other people that are using the ORAN Alliance. So, you know, we're, or China Unicom. So, you know, we're, we're already using both the technologies. It makes sense to just kind of slap them together here to kind of secure that. Um, that's just kind of one of the takeaways I wanted to bring up here. So we, we've discussed Docker containers before in the past. I'm sure you've used them. I'm sure everyone has talked about them, but you know, Docker containers are typically reused resource. You know, they're all shared. So this, this is a good illustration of a traditional container running Docker containers. You know, we do limitations based on C groups. Maybe you're using SEL Linux, maybe, or sorry, SEL aspects of this. Maybe you're using, I don't know, some reconfiguration, read only mounts. You're trying to do things to help optimize this, not running as root user, those kind of things. But, you know, you're seeing that these three different processes are using multiple aspects of the CPU, they're using memory, they're using the network and storage. And since they're all shared, it's a great way for them to also share other things that are maybe more malicious. And, you know, in, in my experience in infrastructure and in other, other, you know, talks with other people, to mitigate this, people were basically running VMs and then running Docker containers inside those VMs. But then we're talking about large systems that require much more uh, you know, resources that are able to run on this just to run your, your Docker containers. The other aspect too was isolation. So we wanna isolate them by using different systems completely. Um, I mean, I, I guess that works, but at this point you're also gonna be using it's gonna cost more money, it's gonna be harder for maintenance, it's gonna be harder for orchestration of this, maybe you wanna do upgrades, bigger problems come along with this. So then we move on to Kata here. So Kata containers are basically isolated themselves on the system using virtualization. So think of it as a, a major VM, but miniaturized. So we're talking about specialized, you know, miniaturized, reduced size kernels for each one of these here. Hardware is virtualized for every one of them. There is no in, you know, intersection between each other here. Um, so for the case of Kubernetes, VM isolation is provided at the pod level. Each pod is booted and it's a lightweight VM. It's a unique uh, kernel instance. So uh, the kernel itself can be modified, even reduced further for a, kind of an attack surface aspect of this. And now each pod is now running its own VM. It no longer has access to the host kernel. It cannot take something from there, which is basically the main concern of, of Docker's, uh, in Docker containers itself. And then you get the full security of being that VM. Now, you know, the, the typical scenario is, you know, you have a bunch of Docker containers. One of them, you know, gets maybe an exploit against it or some issue, then they spread across all of them or you're doing memory poisoning or some aspect of that. And we're, whereas here, we're all isolated individually of each other. So let's talk about orchestration. So I, I haven't gone to depth of here, but this is, this is the RIC. So I wanted to break it down into many, many different components uh, of the RIC itself. So, as we look at it, this entire thing is uh, is the RIC here. So, you know, we have the X app and the configuration manager. So that's the thing that's basically taking these X apps and deploying them onto the system. They're deployed onto the X app namespace. And, you know, in this illustration, we have many, many different X apps that are all doing different, you know, doing different things, but they're all within that same namespace. And then we have, you know, the A1 moderator, which is taking the A1 interface that we talked about before with the non real-time RIC. Those those different aspects here, you know, by having them just as single Docker containers, yeah, there is some inherent security that you're able to get with with Kubernetes. But just think of the implications of this app manager. So if the app manager was to be modified or exploited, perhaps maybe versions of these applications would be then deployed that maybe don't necessarily look malicious, but maybe do something more malicious. Maybe a good example of this is traffic steering. I I always, every couple of milliseconds, tell them to move to a different system or a different RU. So then the entire system doesn't work very well. The customers are having quality service problems. Or perhaps maybe the machine learning has an, a new model that is being deployed on there that causes some other aspect of the system to no longer work. Um, a good aspect to, or sorry, a good idea also is the MRR, RMR, which is like the RIC messaging service, which basically goes across and talks to all these different systems. So if you were to induce latency into that, then the entire system that 
brings up the RIC no longer works correctly or very slow. So I wanted to show a little bit more about like a Kubernetes kind of typical aspect of this. So, you know, we, we try to mitigate these by putting them on different nodes. Um, maybe perhaps you're running them on VMs. And, you know, on the one on the left, we're talking about standard containers. Standard containers, you know, we have four different systems, maybe a master along with all these, these additional other systems here. And to separate them is how we do this isolation. So your cost is four different machines. Whereas, let's say, for example, we use the Kata containers. And, you know, I want to also illustrate in this that not everything has to be running Kata. You can run whatever runtime you want. Um, so if you want to run without Kata, for example, on the far right, they're not using Kata at all. So maybe, maybe this is just some other application that you have no concerns with, or maybe it's a test environment. I have no idea. But within this here, you know, each one of them is running on a single node. So, you know, I have one node that's maybe the master, and I have a second node that contains all these different services that are all separated by that virtualization within Kata. So this is just an example of, of the RIC, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, uh, the, the different aspects of the namespacing on there. So we have, you know, the RIC, the RIC apps. So each one of those apps is all isolated by itself, no more interaction with each other. And then, you know, we're talking about the RIC PLC, which is basically the, the, the initial setup of the system. And then the infrastructure that runs the RIC itself, those are all containerized in this Kata environment. So how hard is Kata to orchestrate and what's its life cycle like? So I'm sure a lot of everyone's like, okay, Kubernetes is kind of hard to already use, or maybe you're relatively new with it. It's already kind of, it's it's a little bit mind boggling a little bit at this point. So I, I understand the, the kind of hesitance of that. I know you gain a lot, but how hard is it to use and manage? Well, to basically get Kata running, there's only a few different steps that have to be done. You have got to install or compile version two of Kata. You got to modify your container D. You got to modify the runtime classes for Kata, and then just modify your plugins. From there, it's basically plug and play. You from there are then now using Kata on there and you can change it for different hypervisors. So let's say for example, you wanna run some as Firecracker, some as the QME. So uh, you have lots of different options um, and it's just a relatively modification of you know a bunch of YAML files and that's it. So the Kata agent is running on the guest system that's basically supervising and managing these containers. So it is a separate system, you know, compared to like kube control aspects. So, you know, you're not you're going to want to look at to see which which containers are running Kata, upgrading, modifying, and modifying those. So there's a a little bit of upkeep that is a little different, but not by far many many steps or anything like that. And then we can also use the lib container to manage the lifecycle of this container as well. So the idea is that you can reuse aspects of this and then be able to deploy a brand new pod, a brand new container, whatever you want to do with that here. And, and then it's also responsible for the entire life cycle. So Kub, uh, Kubelet is still taking care of the entire system. It's not like you have an entire separate item that, that does this. So I want to talk a little bit about conclusions. So we talked a lot about 5G and a lot of the aspects of it, the really cool things that are on there. So 5G is quickly taking hold and ARM is already going to be part of this. So as we mentioned, ARM has many, many different aspects of, of the 5G system. We're working with hardware and software uh, companies to, to deploy these systems here. I've already you know, completed the porting process of the real-time RIC. So we already have some major decision-making inside of this here. But also talking about that real-time RIC, there's a lot of security concerns. We've already gone over them many, many times, but you know, we want to be able to talk about this. And most of these are easily remedied through Kata. I'm not saying Kata is the one-all be-all. That is not the case here. But the idea is that it's a very simple decision that can be made to help modify this and make it more secure than it inherently is currently. And then the complexity of solving this has a combination of different tools that are already readily available right now. Um, and then it also is supported by ARM. So one, you're going to get the the security aspects of the ORAN, you know, SC, the RIC itself, by utilizing Kata and then utilizing ARM, you're able to get the optimization and the throughput that you're looking for at a cheaper cost and lower power. So I wanted to also mention too, um, that I'll be attending along with a couple of my other colleagues, uh, KubeCon, hope to see you guys there. We will also be on the virtual and physically there as well. 
Um, and then we also have ARM Dev Summit, which is coming up as well. Hopefully you can also join that and learn a little bit more about ARM itself and how to integrate your systems with them. And then I also wanted to include some of the blogs that we have talking about 5G and the Cassini project. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I hopefully this was educational and was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, please you know, put them in the chat and I'll do my best to, to talk to you about those. Um, now, if you have specific questions about ARM and about maybe it's roadmap or some questions like that, I can definitely direct those to like go to market strategy people where they can reach out to you to provide more detail to you. Thank you. Okay, if anyone has questions, let's drop them in that chat box so we can get get some answers. Looks like there might be a few in here, Kyle. Did you yeah, address yeah, these I'm, as I'm, we were going through? Okay, so um, we're up to date. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of going through some of your problems with originally. Yeah, so I just I'll directly reply to these these people here on this. Um, okay, so what's the problems with containers? Original, not not Kata. So basically, the idea is the 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 containers are using, let's say, say Kubernetes with Docker. So Docker is utilizing shared resources across this. So for example, if one of the system or one of the Docker containers is utilizing a piece of memory, perhaps another service that's running on the Docker container or on the system itself can cause either, let's say, memory poisoning, you're putting something in there that the Docker container can read, or maybe you're modifying another container where you're doing breakouts from that. Kata itself, um, is able to mitigate that by using the VM. I'm not saying the VM is 100% the right answer. I'm just saying that's much easier by virtualizing the entire system and its resources than to just directly, um, you, you know, share it across. Um, so why ARM is only porting from x86? I remember similar efforts being done by EPC. Why not natively build the RIC on ARM architecture to build more efficient solutions, trying to understand what maybe the limitations here on ARM? So um, the idea was that previously on some of these telecom systems, they were mostly built on specialized architectures or specialized systems, um, you know, major throughput systems here x86 is just kind of like the typical partner that was done on here. Um, so most of these systems were already developed on x86 in mind. ARM itself is in the process, you know, is we're pushing towards getting this completed and, and moving forward on there. So we the porting process is just something that we did this, you know, to bring it over to here. But in the future, I don't see a reason why ARM would not be developing these, these applications or these architectures itself to help optimize them. But um, that's just to answer why the RIC itself was ported. I, I can take this that question as well and bring it to our go-to-market strategy people to, to give them more of an understanding of what you're looking for. Um, so if security concerns, why not use Firecracker, as you mentioned, more as restrictive instead of Kata? So Kata is the VM, is the same exact, is the VM itself, Firecracker, QME, those are the hypervisors. So you could use Firecracker, it is more restrictive. That's that's perfectly fine. A lot of people do use it. Um, it's just much more restrictive. I guess it kind of depends on what, you know, it's different flavors, whatever you choose to, to pick. Um, how can we manage the Kata containers via OpenStack, Kubernetes? So Kata containers um, are typically managed through the, the Kata agent, but the entire system is still orchestrated through Kubernetes. So uh, there's not necessarily um, like one option or all options. They, I don't know if it works with OpenStack. I'm not, I'm not completely sure on that. I have not used it in that aspect, but um, you should be able to, to be able to utilize, deploy, check the status of those containers you know, resource allocations, those kind of things through the, the Kata agent. Uh, if we're going VM for isolation, why not use kubevert? 
Um, I'm not sure, Cooper. I, I, I don't know how to answer that one. I'll have to get back to you on that one. I'm not really sure. I have not utilized that before. Um, if any register signs, okay. Um, any performance impact detected on Kata and Run C? Um, yeah, so there is some inherent performance impact. Uh, you know, always if you're adding extra layers, there's always going to be something that's going to slow it down. So I am not saying that by switching from direct Kata containers on Kubernetes that you will see the exact same performance. That is not the case. I mean, you still see the same exact impact done on the previous mitigation for Docker containers when you ran them as a VM and then ran the Docker containers in there. One, there's the orchestration aspect of that. But performance is, you know, you, you have an entire system that has to deal with all the virtualization of a much larger system, all these kernel, this much larger kernel with a lot of different impact on that. Whereas Kata has a similarized slim diversion of this of this kernel. So it may not have all of the different aspects as a full-fledged system, but you know, you're you're still gonna get some impact. That is hundred percent gonna happen. If you're not sharing the bare metal resources or some version of that. And you're virtualizing it, then yeah, there's going to be extra stuff. There's going to be extra layers. That's that's un unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Um, any other questions from anybody else? I mean, I, I can dive deeper into some of the 5G if that's more interesting to people. Um, whatever you'd like to go over. See if anybody weighs in on for us. Okay. There we go. Okay, so porting the legacy VNS. Okay. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the big overlying thing with 5G is, you know, before with 4G, 3G, or even previous technologies, I mean, you're talking about proprietary systems that are running major applications that do everything. These are not configurable outside of like the initial setup and run of this. Whereas now we're pushing more towards the container, the VNFs, to be able to run these systems independently, scale them appropriately, run them, upgrade them very quickly. Um, that's kind of like the overarching theme of 5G is to be able to, to do this much quicker, much faster instead of, you know, buying, you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment for each one of them. And that's how you upgrade is by buying another one. Now you can scale those resources appropriately. Some 5G setups have special network requirements. Like, okay, do these apps adapt to this use case? Um, so the X apps itself can be developed by uh, the operators. They can be developed by third parties. So I don't see a reason why any of these applications could not be developed in, in a special requirements for those operators. The idea is to utilize and leverage these, these X apps to make things much faster to be able to utilize and modify, change, change the system almost instantaneously. So I, I don't see a reason why not. Um, I guess the only aspect that I, I can say is that, you know, the ORAN, the XAPT itself are relatively new-ish. Um, you know, these systems are being deployed as we speak. People are utilizing them now. So there's always going to be some bugs that are, have to be worked out for these kind of systems. But I don't see a reason why this would not be a direct replacement of, of previous systems. The whole idea of the ORAN Alliance is to provide a system that is now more open to reduce the vendor lock-in. So that way you can use multiple different types of systems, multiple different items together to adapt for the appropriate situation. So I, I, again, I, I, have, I don't know the specific answer to, to your question, Francisco, but um, I, would, I, would, I would think so, yes, that they could do that. Okay, anyone else? Again, if you have other questions too that maybe I don't, I'm not clear on, maybe that's strategy wise where ARM fits in this, what ARM's, you know, 
what, what they're planning to go further on within 5G, I can always reach out to our go-to-market people to provide you better details and have them reach out to you as well. <clears throat> Sounds good. Well, if there aren't any other questions, we can wrap things up. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. I appreciate it. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kyle, for a great presentation. Just a reminder, this um, recording will be online later today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at online programs at cncf.io. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day.